here to discuss human habits and powerful brand marketing is Eric Radel, Chief Executive Officer with the Miller Advertising Agency. Please give him a warm welcome. Good morning. I'd like to spend the next hour uh, with the audience unpacking exactly how human beings form habits, how they break habits, and what behaviors can be influenced by marketing. But I want to have this discussion in the context, a larger context, within a book that I consumed this past fall by Thomas Friedman called Thank You for Being Late. And in this book, he describes what we're going through right now in our society as a communications revolution in the age of acceleration, that things are changing incredibly quickly because of a particular technology. Dating back to 1965, when one of the co-founders of Intel, uh, a guy by the name of Moore, made the claim that we could double microchip performance every two years, almost in perpetuity. Everyone thought he was crazy, and yet to this day, 50 years later, the microchip is expanding in its performance and in its value proposition. What does this mean for human communication? If we extrapolated that same rate of change or rate of acceleration to a Volkswagen Beetle built at the same time, that Beetle would be able to drive at 300,000 miles an hour, go 2 million miles on a single tank of gas, and cost 4 cents. We are experiencing a gap right now between the pace of change that we've achieved with technology and our human ability to absorb it. So as we take a look today at habits in general, I also want to be sensitive to the fact that habits are changing very rapidly and take a reflection of those habits on modern technology. It was Gandhi that said that our beliefs become our thoughts, our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, actions become our habits, our habits become our values, and our values become our destiny. At the core of that is human habit. It's estimated that almost 40% of what we do every day is driven by habit. And the good news is, consumers have habits. They either have your dealership as a habit, they've got a competitor's dealership as a habit, or, like many millennials that we'll address today, they've yet to form a habit. It's important that we delineate the difference, however, between habits and behaviors. A habit is something we do automatically because we've repeated the action so very many times. A behavior is a simple activation to an environmental stimulus. From the time we were children, we learned behaviors and made them into habits through repetition. The military is no different. It trains an amazing squad of soldiers by virtue of rote repetition. But to dig a little bit further on the military piece, specifically the US Marines, their training involves giving them what's called an internal locus of control. That means imbuing in them the certainty that they can absolutely positively impact their experiences through their actions. This gives the Marines the highest job satisfaction rating of any of the armed services and among those in private service. It's not because they're paid a lot. Uh, at the time of the writing of uh, Charles Durig's book, The Power of Habit, he recollected that the Marines were paid around $18,000 a year and they get shot at. Why are they so happy? because they confidently feel like they are in control of their circumstances and control of their life. People want to feel this way too. It's an incredibly important thing to remember as we market to the consumer. It reflects about 80% of the population, people that have this internal locus of control. The other 20% can suffer depression. So think about that as you go to market for your store. Let's talk about the physiology of habit because habit actually causes a change in the human brain. From studies done in the 1990s at MIT, Microchips were inserted in the brains of mice, and they were studied as they navigated a very simple maze. A gate would open, causing a click. The mouse would navigate the maze, sniffing slowly, exploring, making sure there wasn't a cat around every corner, and then finally taking a hard left towards a reward, candy. What the scientists discovered during this exploratory phase were what become the three pivotal keys to forming habit. First, the cue, something that automates a response. Second, a routine, the wandering through the maze, and finally, the consumption of the reward. But fast forward a few weeks and the physiology of the brain of the mouse changes. The click for the cue still exists, sending the mouse down the hallway. But then the mouse just hauls tail, hangs a hard left, and hits the candy, no hesitation. What's become of the mouse's brain activity? Because the same thing happens in humans. At the cue, there's still excitement. And for the smokers in the room, Equate this to smoking. The cue is waking up in the morning, the routine is walking outside to the back patio, 
and then the reward is the cigarette. The mouse is no longer thinking through the center of the process called the routine. That behavior had been subjugated to a different part of the mouse's brain. Same thing happens in humans. We hard write habits to a place in our brain called the basal ganglia. Thousands of these habits are chunked here every day. We couldn't get dressed and make it to work by noon if we hadn't habitualized what sock to put on first, what hand to use to put on toothpaste. We have habits that, again, are 45% of our daily basis. Think about your former president, uh, Barack Obama. You never saw him without a gray suit and a blue tie. He'd habitualized his wardrobe so it was one less thing to think about. People that aren't able to get their habits to habitualize in the basal ganglia suffer from OCD and even schizophrenia. So habits are an incredibly important uh, part of our lives. How many days does it take a habit? Or better said, how many actions does it take to make a habit? Back in the 1950s, a plastic surgeon by the name of Maxwell Maltz noticed that after he did a few nose jobs, the patients would look at themselves in the mirror for approximately 21 days before they realized, you know what, this is my new face. He posited in the book Psychopsychomatics that this in fact was how many times or how many days it took to make a habit. Unfortunately, 21 was a minimum, and most people have extrapolated that as the rule. A further study by Philippa Lally, uh, who's a professor at the London University College, determined after an experiment with 96 different participants that on the short side, it takes 18 days to make a habit. On the long side, it takes 254. On the mid side, 66. But there's good news. There are ways to instantaneously make a habit. And it's by releasing the reward center of the brain. Our reward center in the brain is a chemical called dopamine, and it's how we communicate with ourselves that we like something. It's what happens when we take a drink, have a cigarette, have sex. All these release dopamine in the reward center. So the way a customer experiences your dealership can be a piece of that dopamine release. The other thing to keep in mind about dopamine is that one of the key releasers of dopamine that we have in our lives currently is our cell phone. Every time it beeps, it's telling us somebody wants to talk to us. That's why we track likes. That's why we chase um, affection, if you will, on Facebook. Unfortunately, the dopamine that our phones have is being introduced to children in our society, just like when they're introduced to alcohol at too young an age and they become dependent on that dopamine release. We're gonna explore later in the session exactly how this releasing of dopamine at the dealership level and a process level can influence customer purchase decisions. But if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, using that visual of a cell phone or a smart device in a commercial can actually stimulate interest because that is what in fact people are interested in. Ooh. Mm, that is nice. Duh, save that pick. Mm. That's a match. It's a match. Finding the perfect pre-owned car is easy at Bob Stalling Sunday. Oh. My. <laughs> Choose from over 150 cars and trucks, like this Toyota Camry, only $15,588, or this Honda CRV for $93,88. They can't all be that good. Yes, they can. Bob Stalling Sunday. Yeah, they're all that good. If we're not going to induce uh, dopamine via nefarious methods, uh, it's important to consider the length of the automotive sales cycle. The average 76-year-old will own anywhere between 9 and 13 vehicles or purchase about every 4 to 6 years. So incredibly tough through repetition to make a habit with that individual. If we look at the service cycle, there's obviously a lot more uh, penchant for opportunity. And one particular area to look is in car washes. Um, the average consumer washes their car 13 times a year, more uh, in times of a good economy, less in times of worse. Uh, a dealer outside of San Antonio, Valmark Chevrolet, has taken this to heart and for the last five years have been offering complimentary car washes to their consumers to instill a habit. And while they're not achieving quite 13 washes per consumer per year, they're achieving a level that approaches that level and are seeing repeat and referral business as a result. Because they've done this consistently for four to five years, it's also something that consumers are getting used to asking for almost more than anything else in their advertising. It's also important to realize that they cascade this throughout their advertising. So whether it's TV, radio, newspaper, or email, they're using this as a compelling differentiation point as well as a way to build habit with their consumers. It even works against a conquest consumer. It could be that flipping point or that coin toss that pushes somebody 
in Valmark's direction. Free is good. Uh, Dan O'Reilly, in his book, Irrationally Predictable, uh, talks about the power of free, about the fact that people who don't have cats will line up for a free sample of cat food. Uh, he illustrates an example with Amazon.com specifically, that when they offered free shipping on your books uh, with the purchase of a second book, book sales spiked in the markets where they executed with that uh, philosophy. Flip the page to uh, markets where they didn't, where there was a nominal charge, 20, 30, 40 cents for shipping, no additional increase in purchases. So the power of free is something to remember. We respond to it. It's something that's hardwired into us. Another dealer is executing on the power of free with complementary oil changes uh, for the life of your vehicle. Important to recognize this dealer is also in a fringe market and has to pull people from significant distances to get them to change oil at his dealership. So he offers free pickup and delivery in addition to these oil changes regardless of the type of the oil. I wanna step down on that free pickup and delivery. How long do you think it will be before we fully expect everything picked up and delivered to us? We'll revisit that when it comes to the section on time management and how to motivate habit through time. Here's an example of one of that dealership's commercials proffering free oil change. Hi, I'm Jack Hodge and wow, our cars and trucks are moving crazy fast. This is big. That's why we offer the Hodge promise on every new vehicle we sell. Free oil changes for life means free. At any Hodge store, we'll change your oil for free up to four times a year and that's on any kind of vehicle. Any type of oil, including diesel or synthetic. Even if you already bought from us, free oil changes for life. Come find the ride of your life. You're gonna love it. Hodge, your life, your ride. So this is as good a time as any as to give the uh, NADA disclaimer that I was asked to give about the word free. Not every state uh, allows the use of the word free, so do consult with your attorney uh, or your ad agency with respect to what can be used. Membership. Membership can induce habit. In 1999, American Express introduced their black card. It had no limit on spending, was offered by invitation only to people that had on average $16 million in assets and $1.3 million in household income. No limit, buy anything you want. So people bought Bentleys, they bought jet planes. But the most impressive part about it was the concierge service. It was a reminder service for birthdays, anniversaries. One person, true story, saw Dances with Wolves, liked Kevin Costner's horse, and had American Express source it. American Express offered convenience and was an app before there were apps. And that's something that could be a powerful motivator against human habit is convenience. One dealer example here is the Concierge Plus program offered by Friendly Chevrolet in Dallas. Their philosophy is if it's car, they want to be everything car for the consumer. Oil changes, car washes, tire rotations, rentals, concierge service. They've gone so far as to include a real estate office and a cafe in their dealership. This promise is making incredible strides for them in customer retention because they are executing on everything car. You can't. You can. You can't. You can. You cannot deliver a big message in less than seven seconds. Go! It's truck month at Friendly Chevrolet, and the deals are magical. Take home a new Silverado and save $8,000. All the style and comfort you need, $8,000 off. Or a new Tahoe on sale for just $39,975. $39,9, all with the added benefits of Concierge Plus. Truck month at Friendly Chevrolet. It's magical. Remember what we said about Gandhi and how he described our habits as becoming our values. People will act habitually towards the things they value. When you ask most people, they'll give you a short list. It would include family, and people do value uh, time spent with their families. They value their health, and car companies, as well as dealers on the tier two and three level, have made incredible statements towards safety that people equate with health. Money, people value because it's the currency by which we are measured. Uh, it is also a motivator for purchase. But finally, I want to step down on time. Time is incredibly important in terms of building new habits. Uh, one of my very favorite marketing guys by the name of Ver Gary Vaynerchuk talks about how people are going to make some incredible fortunes in the decade to come, buying and selling back people their time. Uber does this. It gives you back the time waiting for a taxi by giving you total predictability. If I want to order a massage, I can have one here in 10 minutes by uh, pressing the Ease app on my phone. If I was in the right state and wanted marijuana in 10 minutes, I could have it by pressing Nug. 
The world is coming to us through our phones and it is saving us time. And it is the saving of this time that is going to change the automotive economy. Um, a couple of the disruptors, uh, and I think disruptors is a disservice to what some of these new companies are trying to do to the car business and will succeed in doing. They're trying to give people back their time, whether that's delivering the car to the person or giving them a dopamine-influenced uh, experience where they go to an eight-story glass vending machine to pick up their next vehicle. Saving time, inducing dopamine. These are all ways to drive habit. Let's talk about some habit boosters and breakers, and we'll uh, use habit and behavior somewhat interchangeably here. We are a collection of our habits. Again, it's 45% of our daily business, but habits do change. And one of the things that is changing them is the fact that we are seeking and finding an internal locus of control, much like the Marines have, a false one, through our cell phones. Our millennials have dramatically different consumption habits than in fact our senior citizens do. Um, give you a good example. Millennials don't read the paper by and large, but our senior citizens still do. That habit hasn't changed. Um, of the folks that are 65 and older, a full 49% read the paper daily. And by the way, of folks 55 and older, the number's 38%. Those two groups, 55 and up, represent 70% of the disposable income in this country. Their habit hasn't changed, and in fact, they've had the habit for so long, there's nearly no chance of breaking it. I want you to remember that good isn't good forever. Just because you went to market a certain way three or four years ago doesn't mean that it's going to work going forward. And going to market and going to work operationally should be looked at in the same bucket. I would also tell you that your romanticism with the way you've gone to market or the way you conduct business could be your death. These disruptors in our market, from Walmart announcing yesterday that they're getting into the car business in four major metros, to Carvana, funded with over $400 million in venture capital run by guys from Stanford and Harvard, these things will change our business, especially with a younger market that expects everything to be delivered to them. Finally, I'd remind you that the only currency you have when it comes to going to market is getting customer attention. Now, over the past five years, I would posit to you that you've paid too much attention to getting attention and getting a rival digitally, but have not produced any arousal. And we'll speak to the fact that people need to hear things on an emotional level to make decisions and form habits. Very often, people's habits are well in front of current advertising. Ideally, it would be your charge to shrink the gap between current habits and current advertising. This gap I would refer to as arbitrage. This is the space that you can be that other people are not in yet. Therefore, your value per eyeball is best. Some of the most crowded spaces right now are paid search. There's less of a left-hand rail. More people are participating in the space. Google is saying that clicks are down anywhere from 19 to 22%. That space is fully mature and crowded out, and everyone's paying more and more to be in it. Same thing with Facebook, and we've got to quit feeding Facebook anyway, because if they ever do fully develop their virtual reality platform, Oculus, it'll put you out of business for good. But it's this arbitrage, or reverse arbitrage. There are less and less people in the paper, and we've discussed how valuable that audience is. Maybe this is where you need to be. But speaking to fewer eyeballs, or more eyeballs for less money, is just a good business decision. And that could mean something as simple as having a strategy against Instagram, Snapchat, Yik Yak, Twister, or any of the other apps that are driving specifically millennial traction. Let's talk about some habit accelerants. First is utility. Humans are no different than animals in that if we find an easier, more pleasant way to do something, we're going to execute on it. And utility is what's driving the app space. Origin. People care about where they're from. Because we have a finite existence on this planet, we anchor ourselves to being from a place that can drive behavior and habit. Place is important too. Place means a person understands fully what a brand means. Obviously good examples would include Apple and innovation, GE and talent acquisition, uh, Disney and customer care. Authenticity, something simple that says to the consumer in no uncertain terms, what you are saying resonates with them as true. Emotion, no, emo no decision has ever been made without positive feeling emotion. So lacing emotion into any communication that we have with our consumers can drive habit and positive behavior. And finally, nostalgia. We remember the past as better than it was, and that's a tool that can be used in our marketing, in our outbound marketing. 
Couple examples. First uh, creative example I want to show you is one that executes on both nostalgia and origin. It's called Silverado. Football, barbecue, good, good friends, life in a Silverado. Cowboys, boots, in a hard work day, life in a Silverado. Pick it up, Texas. Friday nights, under the lights, life in a Silverado. Honk a Thompson Rodeo, life in a Silverado. Big Texas and float trips, all across the Lone Star State. Silverado and Chevrolet. Here's an incredibly strong example that appeals to both emotion and to origin. It's called I Can. I can. I can. I can. I can push harder. I can move faster. I can make this shot. I can. You can. Peter's Ram Trucks can deliver. Save more at Peter's Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram. During Ram Power Days, save 20% on a new Ram 1500. 20% savings on a new Ram pickup. I can. You can. Who can? We can. Who can? We can. Peter's Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram. The number one Ram dealer in East Texas with the largest Ram inventory between Shreveport and Dallas. I also want you to notice the subtle twist in that commercial that switched from I can to you can, activating the consumer's internal locus of control. Anytime you can make the, feel, the consumer feel in control of the, the car buying process, you made a step in the right direction. Finally, I want to share with you um, a spot that showcases the importance of origin, uh, including the Swan Brothers. These guys are hometown boys uh, from the dealership's hometown, played on The Voice, are currently touring with Carrie Underwood. When a consumer sees that, they see people that they know, that they grew up with, and it further, further identi identifies them to the dealership brand. This is country, this is hot. It's time to ride, time to roll. It's time to hit the open road. 10,000 off any new Ford F-150 XLT, 25 to choose, or 12,000 off any new 2016 Super Duty Crew Cab, everyone in stock. Plus, free oil changes for life at your hometown dealer, Hodge Ford. Welcome. Come on. This is country. This is Hodge. Proximity principle. You can drive habits for your dealership brand by putting it next to other good brands. This can be something as simple as a co-branding or a ladder positioning effort for your brand. Um, if you can co-brand with a local Chick-fil-A, the value of your brand goes up and we all know how habit-inducing Chick-fil-A is, so win-win. The other thing I would encourage you to do is on a media buy perspective, if you wanna get really, really granular, see if you can't get your spots to play next to spots that have higher brand, not automotive, but higher brand value than say something like um, daytime public uh, attorneys or title loans. This real estate, media real estate, is no different than actual real estate and the quality of your location matters in terms of driving habits and building dealership brand. The exclusivity paradigm, should people be in car spots? If you wanna build habits and influence behavior, the answer is yes, because the people in the spots tell the consumer that's who should be driving that vehicle. So upgrade the quality, by that I mean looks, of the people in your spots. It's why Dior and Lincoln are using Matthew McConaughey to make the brand aspirational because something that's aspirational is naturally more habit forming and behavior changing. Also, I would encourage you to use technology in media. Uh, used to be if we were trying to find, by way of example, BMW owners, we might have to just throw a dart and think, you know what, I bet they're watching XYZ News Show. In this example, I would have you look at the fact that the BMW owner, even though it's the third ranked show of the four under consideration, index is higher uh, with CNN than it does Fox News. So there's a couple lessons to be learned here. One, the pull through of set top data is further allowing us to identify where people habitually flock and execute on that information. 
The second thing I would tell you or remind you uh, is that you shouldn't be buying to see your own commercial. Um, and this is an instance where I wouldn't see my own commercial if I was a BMW owner. In terms of seeking like owners or the habit of flocking because it, people do tend to do stuff together that have habitualized a behavior, I would encourage you to pull your database, your CRM, through a filtration platform every year and look at your owners. See who you've got in terms of habit and see who you're missing. So this example uh, is of a dealer, of a Ford dealer, that's missing everybody uh, in their geography that doesn't have significant household income. So we start to look at their media buy, we start to look at their creative decisions. Are they turning off middle to lower income consumers? Or finally, we'd actually wanna look at their sales process to see if it's just not set up. Uh, level of education. This particular dealer is missing everybody without a high school diploma or without um, some high school training. These are valuable consumers specific on the car market, which dealers are struggling with, and in the used car market. Why? Is it media, is it creative, or is it sales process? Level of residence. If you find out that your consumers don't have you as a habit, it could be that they don't see you until they've lived in your locale for three to four years. That's a problem, typically creative. I'd encourage you to market across platforms. So by way of example, NFL fans don't just consume NFL information or NFL content on television. They consume it on the web, they read it during email, they'll go to the bathroom and see it uh, at Buffalo Wild Wings. It's third party data that can be pulled through a streaming platform. I would encourage you to look at each of the places you're trying to form habit and cross platforms with that formation. Directional comfort. One of our habits, everybody, is staying close to home. We try to find our lives within five to 10 miles of our home. So if you're a dealer in a fringe market, like this example of uh, Maxwell that's in Taylor, outside of Austin or Round Rock, you don't wanna try to educate the consumer to break a habit and drive to a town they could potentially have never heard of. You wanna use locators. So instead of being from Taylor, Texas, which I'm sure is a really nice town, I wanna to be 15 minutes from Round Rock or something that's simple and doesn't violate the consumer's habit. Reprogramming. Some of the most powerful things you can do to influence habit and behavior starts with practiced gratitude. Two of the most powerful words in the English language are thank you. Not thank you for making us the biggest or the best, but just thank you and meaning it. Optimism. Um, the neuroscientist Tally Shiro has a great TED talk on optimism. Um, show of hands, how many of you think you're an above average driver? You all do, which is statistically impossible. We're optimistic about who we think we are and who we think we can be. 80% of us on average are optimists. So your marketing should reflect that optimism, that the person deserves more, can have more at your dealership. Finally, affirmations. People need to be told they deserve it and that they're good enough. And your marketing needs to focus on the consumer, not on you. Consumer benefit drives behavior. Here's an example of a pre-roll spot that does just that. We designed this for you. We built this for you. Coming soon, Five Star Subaru built as the largest Subaru store in America, right here in Grapevine. From the name you trust, Sam Pack, Five Star Subaru at the heart of it all. Show of hands, who's seen the movie The Stanford Prison Experiment? If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. Uh, back in 1971, Stanford psychiatrists did an experiment where they had 11 students act as prison guards in an environment and another 11 act as prisoners. The experiment was supposed to last 20 days. They had to cut it off after six because the prisoners were getting beaten and abused by the guards. Moral, and the moral of that story is that people fall into the environment they're placed in. Uh, Shakespeare said, all the world is a stage. So give your consumer the, the internal locus of control and the ability not to act like a prisoner in a super structured environment. I go back to five years from now, will we think it's ridiculous that we actually went to a dealership to buy a car and that it wasn't delivered to us. The other thing I would encourage you to do is explore the opportunity to suss out or know what consumer reaction looks like during your sales process because the marketing to a consumer does not end uh, with the TV spot you ran. It's inside the dealership and the technology exists in real time to determine a person's 
happiness, sadness, tension, anger, and frustration, and give that feedback to somebody else at the dealership besides a sales consultant to get involved and potentially save a car deal. From Princeton University, Yuri Masson tells us that storytelling is one of the best ways to change habits and influence behavior. When one person tells another person a story, it actually causes their brains, sometimes in as short as eight seconds, to move into synchrony. Telling a person a series of facts has never caused brain synchrony. If you want someone, like Peter Frampton said, to feel like I do, telling them, as a, story, telling them a story is the best way to bring them to the position that you'd like. Uh, a little bit about yourselves and about being on TV talent. If there's any hunters in the audience, what you're looking at now is a behavior of an antelope called pronking. It's a diamatic behavior, and they do it to show predators that they're not the one you want to pick on, that they're strong. Another diamatic behavior, by way of example, are creatures that make themselves look bigger to scare away potential predators. If your TV spot has you getting larger and being expressive towards the consumer, it will scare them away. The Ebbinghaus illusion is another one I see on the tally all the time. There's one dealer in every town that's like this. They've got a, spink, a pink sports coat, a purple tie. They look like Easter threw up on them. The Ebbinghaus illusion means you are trying to attract a mate against a bland background. Is that really the message you want to send to your consumer to encourage a good habit? Is that you're trying to attract them as a mate? Finally, some body deceptions. Um, if you're trying to be small, it speaks of dishonesty. If you won't show a consumer your palms, it speaks of dishonesty. This is dishonest. This also is dishonest because it's um, back in, uh, if you even say Roman times, a way to say you are covering your intention or covering your bodily organs in preparation for battle. These are all things that people sniff of as incorrect and will form a bad habit or at least a bad behavior if they're included in your creative. Anticipation is the stuff that makes a habit really, really sticky. We talked about cue, routine, and reward being the core tenets. Anticipation is one of the most powerful feelings in the world, and there's a phenomenon called nexting. Nexting is the fact that we are happier eight weeks before our vacation than we actually are on our vacation. Anticipation can actually make a habit into a craving and make it undefeatable. Meet Julio the monkey. Julio was studied in the 1980s, and Julio was put in his environment and asked to pull a lever when a colored shape came on the screen, at which point juice would flow into Julio's mouth. Julio dug it. Julio created a habit like we're familiar with that included cue, routine, and reward. But over time, he developed a feeling of anticipation where the dopamines would spike in his brain before he even got the juice. He would not leave his cage when the door was open, when there was food outside of it that was different than his reward, because he anticipated positively the event. This level of anticipation was actually again discussed by Tali Chereau in a recent TED Talk, that most people would pay more for a celebrity kiss delivered in three days than a celebrity kiss delivered immediately because they knew they wanted the anticipation or the planning around what would happen around that event. How can you create anticipation for your dealerships? Part of it's through your marketing. It doesn't end uh, when the consumer comes in the dealership. In fact, it's the payoff for that anticipation that you need to paint, um, whether it's a fulfillment of the promise of everything car, a fulfillment of the promise that you do, in fact, speak Spanish. It's fulfilling that anticipation at the dealership level with point of purchase that gets the consumer in a mindset that they're in the right place. Let's talk about your habits, because as we know, if you repeat the action long enough, those habits do in fact become your values and your destiny. I would argue that your habits would become your brand. A lot of people that I talk to don't know who they want to be from a branding perspective, and I'll tell you one good place to start is with a keystone habit. A keystone habit is the kind of habit that can influence all kinds of other habits in your life. For me, it's exercise. I know that I'm a better guy at work, a better man to my wife, a better father to my kids when I have a regular exercise program. I also tend to eat better. Two examples from corporate America. When Paul O'Neill took over Alcoa in 1987, the, the company was in a financial shambles. At a shareholders meeting, he refused to discuss how he was going to turn the financial piece around. He said, nope, the basic core tenant of our company is going to be to keep everybody safe. They melted hot metal. There were accidents and deaths at Alcoa. 
After a year of changing the way the company communicated and focused around safety, how they treated each other, he had quintupled net profits to the company and influenced financial, safety, and cultural mores there with a singular focus on a core keystone habit. Howard Schultz, founder of Starbucks, was a kid from the projects who opened up 17,000 coffee retailers in 50 different countries, and his core tenet is training. He knows that he can't defend margin and beat away the likes of the McDonald's M Cafe without training for his employees. And any time Starbucks, in Howard Schultz's absence, has pared back training, they've suffered financially and he's had to come back on board and reiterate that that is their keystone habit. Keystone habits are incredibly important to building a brand. Now, what's a brand? I'm going to go through this quickly, but for the fact that brand has changed. Uh, this is a, a picture from a trip that I took with my wife to Pompeii a few years ago. Pompeii was covered in ash in 79 AD, but before that it was an incredibly vibrant trading port, and a trading port in those days attracted people that spoke hundreds of languages. So when you walk through the market, there was no writing because you couldn't satisfy that level of writing across that many languages. There were simply pictures of what they had. We have stuff is the very basic level of branding. Flash forward to 1915 and the introduction of Pepsodent. Pepsodent was the first brand that I could find that actually used the habit loop. The cue, run your tongue across your teeth, the routine, brush your teeth to make them beautiful. The reward, you have beautiful teeth. Prior to Pepsodent doing this, only 7% of US consumers had toothpaste in their cabinet. A decade later, 65%, now it's ubiquitous. And oh, by the way, the mint is useless. There's no reason for toothpaste to have taste. That's the anticipation that makes it a craving. Flash forward to the 1950s and what Volkswagen did for brand. They made the first connection between the company that made the product and the product. By saying something clever to the consumer, they said to the consumer, we think you're smart enough to get this and we like you. And it made an incredible impact to their brand. Affirmations we talked about earlier. Flash forward to Nike and Apple in the 1980s. These are brands that fully understood that it mattered how you felt, and that was the core philosophy to their branding, was this is how this product should make you feel. The only problem with approaching brand from any of those directions, and they're all valid, is that it doesn't tell you anything about the company necessarily, or the people, or the culture, or the behaviors, or the mores. The good or bad news is that with social media, and with this accelerated communications revolution, everybody knows what's inside your company. So even if you're executing on your core keystone habit, you still have to have the support of the consumer telling your story for a unified brand. I've seen dealers execute on any number of these seven options as keystone habits very successfully. It doesn't so much matter which one you choose as that you've got leadership that will accept nothing less and compensation and reward and recognition models that promote that keystone habit. And like Paul O'Neill at Alcoa, the stones to fire somebody, one of his best producers, because he failed to report a safety violation. That's the guts that it takes to fully defend a brand. I think the Marines do one of the best jobs of this of any company uh, in this country, if you can call them a company. They exemplify a keystone habit of loyalty to God, to country, and to each other, and they never back away from it. Final question I'll leave you with is, do you have a culture worth advertising? I've given you probably 20 or 25 tidbits today on what it looks like to influence or break habits, to influence behavior with certain creative strategies. I would challenge you to go back and ask what if. What if I could do it all over from ground zero? What if I was tabula rasa right now with my brand? Do I have a keystone habit? Am I prepared for the disruptions that are invariably gonna enter our market? Am I ready for a world where cars are delivered? Where an intermediary with an incredible distribution like Walmart or Amazon, which owns 10% of every single thing sold online, they are getting into the business, the strength of your brand and your brand's flexibility to deliver operationally will drive your success going forward. That's my time. Thanks a lot.